we'll get recording. So that's the uh, that'll be the final exam on Platinum Planner through the EMS testing. And it is a hundred question exam, and I believe you'll have um, I believe you'll have two two to three hours to do it. So please make sure that you have a good internet connection, uh, that you are not in a position where you could get called out or have to um, interrupt the exam or anything like that. Um, because you kind of want to just take a, a couple, at least a couple of hour block uh, to work through it, get your notes in order, uh, whatever other study aids and guides you have, get all that in order and just make sure that you can, can access it. Um, obviously, I, I anticipate you all will be using those to help you through the exam. It's 100 questions, multiple choice. And they are questions that have been developed through the EMS testing group. It's kind of standardized uh, types of questions. Um, so they're not questions that, that I, I developed. And that'll just kind of allow us to pivot into talking about, uh, let's see, some additional stuff. Um, the comprehensive re review exams are all completed. Uh, there were a few people that logged into my office hours yesterday and we talked about those. So hopefully you all found that, that helpful, that, that review. I'm not going to review it here because we still have a lot of content uh, to get through. Um, but there were two questions that we identified that with the content of those questions had not been covered yet in lecture. So those questions are gonna be thrown out and everybody will receive points for them. So uh, the grades will change. I just was not able to do that until everybody had completed the, um, the exam and there were still people as of yesterday afternoon that had not completed it. So now that everyone's completed, I can go in and update the grades so everyone should see or most of you should see uh, a slight uh, increase in the number of points you got on that particular exam. Uh, so any questions, any questions moving forward or moving into uh, the lecture, lecture topics that we need to get through today? Okay. I think I've got all, all the homework graded as well, uh, with the exception of uh, some of the chapter summaries, like all the acid base, fluid electrolyte assignments, all of that. Everybody should have grades uh, for all of those as well. So every, you kind of going into the final exam, uh, you should have a pretty decent idea of, of what your grade is looking like. Okay, well, with that in mind, let's just go ahead and uh, get through uh, the last bit of material that I want to talk about. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, um, it, it is important to read the book because I can't possibly go over every single point in every single chapter uh, that this course covers. And so there is an expectation that you're reading the book, you're highlighting, you're taking notes, et cetera, um, to ensure that you have a complete or you've had complete exposure to um, all the content. So what I want to do is I want to spend some time talking about some additional laboratory tests. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some radiology as well, just because we do run into that as uh, providers. So I have a couple of PowerPoints, and these are the, the PowerPoints that have been um, in Canvas. So you, they're there, and you can reference them. Um, and they're the same ones that I'll be using today. Uh, so I'm going to start off talking about um, labs, first of all. So let me just go ahead and go into share here. One of the first PowerPoints I've used, I tend not to do a whole lot of PowerPoint stuff, but these are PowerPoints that I created. They're a little stripped down, high yield information for you all. Some of it will be review, so I will go through it rather quickly. Because we've talked about some of these already. All right, so here we go. So this is just an introduction to the fishbone lab charting that we've talked about, your CBC and your, your BMP, your basic metabolic panel. All right. These are some uh, values. We've talked about these already, the H and H or the hemoglobin and hematocrit, uh, the WBC, the white count and the platelets, all the the four critical values that we look at on the complete blood count or the CBC. 
All right, we've also talked about the uh, differential or the manual diff, the never let monkeys eat bananas, the five general types of white blood cells. And specifically, we talked about the neutrophils where you have banded and segmented neutrophils. And we know that if your white count is elevated and you have greater than six, greater than a six pack of bands, that is indicative of a left shift, which tends to suggest that there is an acute bacterial infection going on. All right. We've also talked about the BMP or the basic metabolic panel or the SMA7 or the CHEM7, right? And we talked about sodium, potassium, chloride, CO2, which is really the venous bicarbonate. And remember that carbon dioxide gets converted to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions, so it can be transported. Uh, the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine, these are renal tests. Look at our renal function. All right. We've already talked a little bit about sodium imbalance, so I won't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, hyponatremia tends to be the, the, one of the most common issues that we run into, and if it's severe, you know, if it's less than, than uh, you know, and down into the 120s or less, um, right, the blood becomes very hypotonic compared to the cells, and so fluid begins shifting into the cells, they begin to swell, and that's a big problem in the brain. So you have neurological findings right? Lots of different causes, um, any diuretic hormone imbalances, acute loss of sodium through sweating, you can dilute it, right? MDMA, for example, fluid overload, those kinds of things. And we talked about that already. Remember, sodium correction is done very slowly because we do not want to precipitate osmotic demyelination syndrome. Uh, typically, we'll use a 3% uh, or hypertonic saline. We talked about potassium balances already as well. We'll talk about them again um, later on in the course. And then just some miscellaneous chemistry values, the calcium, when we talked about hypocalcemia specifically, um, the main, main causes of hypocalcemia tend to be uh, loss of the parathyroid glands or the parathyroid gland function. They run alongside the thyroid glands. And then pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas is a major cause as well. And a little bit about magnesium. Uh, magnesium is important for uh, normal cardiac conduction and, and certain dysrhythmias, um, specifically certain life-threatening dysrhythmias, we may actually use magnesium as, a, um, as an anti-dysrhythmic. And we'll talk about that later on in the paramedic course. All right. These are some labs that look at the thyroid, the function of the thyroid gland and that, that the thyroid gland releases hormones uh, thyroxine, uh, T3 and T4, and that helps regulate overall body metabolism. Um, and so we look at the TSH, that is the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's a hormone from the pituitary that stimulates the thyroid. And if that TSH is elevated, that suggests that the thyroid is not working. Um, it is what we call hypothyroidism. So the brain is trying to tell the thyroid gland to work. So what happens is TSH levels increase. And then the opposite tends to happen if the thyroid is overactive, what we call hyperthyroidism, where the TSH levels decrease, the body is trying to tell the thyroid not to secrete as much uh, thyroxine. Uh, these are pancreatic enzymes. This is actually one of the questions I decided to throw out um, on the Com comprehensive review was that I was talking about uh, pancreatic uh, pancreatic uh, enzymes were on that question. So these are the serum amylase and lipase, and these tend to elevate when the pancreas becomes inflamed. Um, the white count tends to elevate as well. And in severe cases of pancreatitis, you can become anemic, your calcium levels can get low, you can develop ARDS as well. Um, that is a big risk factor for ARDS. And there is something we're not going to, you're not going to have to learn it. And I'm not going to make anybody calculate it. Just want you to be aware of it. It's called Ransom's criteria. And essentially there are certain critical labs like the calcium and the H and H um, that get, a, that get a point value that get a weighted point value and depending, and then you add these points up. Okay. The patient's calcium is this and their white count is this and their hemoglobin hematocrit is this and they get so many points for those values and if their points uh, 
And then depending on what you get for their score, that gives you some idea of what their uh, mortality might be um, and gives you an idea of kind of how sick they are. And so that's called Ransom's criteria. We've talked about these already, but these are um, labs that look at the liver function, your LFTs or your liver function tests, the AST, also known as the SGOT, um, the ALT, uh, the bilirubin, and there are different ways of looking at bilirubin. There's something called the total bilirubin, which you see here. And then there are two forms of bilirubin. There is what we call conjugated and unconjugated. Essentially what happens is, does anyone know where Billy Rubin comes from? First of all, remember where does Billy Rubin come from? Didn't right you say the blood? blood cells? Yep, yep. It's a product of um, red blood cells that break down. Yeah, and so what happens is that Bill, as that Billy Rubin's released into your blood, it's what we call unconjugated. It's kind of in its original form, and then when the Billy Rubin goes to the liver, the liver attaches other molecules to it. And, and essentially um, integrates bilirubin into bile. That, that's part of what gives bile kind of its, its, um, its color. Um, and that's what we call conjugated bilirubin, bilirubin that has been processed by the liver. Uh, we talked about the ammonia. Remember that ammonia gets converted to urea in the urea cycle of the liver and then the urea can be eliminated in the urine. So it is a less toxic form of ammonia. If the ammonia gets elevated, that can cause uh, hepatic encephalopathy or a, a liver associated dysfunction of the brain. Um, and then coagulopathies or what we call clotting disorders are also, also common with liver failure because um, many of the so-called clotting factors that we require are produced in the liver. Um, so that brings us to the next set of labs I want to uh, briefly talk about, and this is uh, the coagulation studies, and this is the other question I threw out. So these are the common coagulation studies, the PT, it's also known as a prothrombin time, um, and essentially what they do is they take blood and um, they measure how long it takes for blood to clot in certain uh, situations, and these are how they get these values. So the PT is a prothrombin time. The PTT is the partial thromboplastin time, and uh, the, these tend to be done together, the PT and the PTT, and um, there are some medications that impact them. For example, Coumadin, which is a type of, which is an anticoagulant, it actually um, interferes with vitamin K synthesis, it interferes with an enzyme required uh, to uh, synthesize or, or to recycle vitamin K. And when you inhibit that enzyme, you inhibit vitamin K essentially, and that prevents clotting. And so what'll happen is these times will get longer. And so in the case of somebody on Coumadin, their PT will get longer. And that's the lab that we focus on um, in what's called a Coumadin clinic. So somebody who's on Coumadin, because Coumadin um, interacts with a lot of drugs and it has a very, fairly narrow, what we call therapeutic window or therapeutic index. That is to say, the concentration where we get the effects we want and the concentration where we have toxicity is, is pretty narrow. Um, so we need to monitor and watch these patients very closely. Um, and in many areas, uh, Coumadin is being replaced by the newer anticoagulants uh, known as the DOAX, so the uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants. Um, they tend to be uh, a lot safer. They tend not to have the interactions uh, the medication, various medication interactions we see with Coumadin, and they don't need to have their blood drawn every week to make sure that their, um, their clotting times um, are, are, aren't too abnormal. Uh, the PTT, uh, another anticoagulant called heparin, is what really impacts the PTT. So if somebody's on heparin and heparin derivatives like Lovenox or low molecular weight heparin, um, we look at the PTT. The D-dimer, the D-dimer is a non-specific test of hypercoagulation. So if somebody is more likely to, to clot or has produced an abnormal clot, this tends to result in an elevated D-dimer. And so we would see these in people that have like pulmonary embolisms, deep vein thromboses, 
Um, we'll see this elevate in DIC as well, because remember DIC is a where you have excessive clotting followed by excessive bleeding. Um, and then the hallmark finding for DIC is something called fibrin split products, the FSP, also known as the FDP fibrin degradation products. So these are the major coagulation studies looking at the blood clotting. And of course, the platelet count, uh, you could include that in here as well, but we've already talked about the platelet count earlier. All right, cardiac panels. We've talked about that. The uh, troponin um, is one of the most sensitive values that we look at, um, as well as the CKMB. Um, and CK or creatine kinase is an enzyme that is released by injured muscle. Um, but the MB fraction of CK is specific to the heart. So you can draw what's called a CK on somebody and any muscle damage will cause the CK to elevate, including rhabdo. The CK tends to be very high in rhabdo. The CK will also elevate in the setting of a heart attack. So what we need to do is we wanna look at the cardiac specific fraction of CK and that is the CKMB. I just remember it as, um, as the MB is the, the myocardial branch of CK, if you will. So CK myocardium branch looks at the heart. Um, the myoglobin is sometimes assessed, but like the CK, the myoglobin is fairly nonspecific um, because you have myoglobin in all of your muscles pretty much, right? Those are cells, um, the, our myoglobin is a molecule very similar to hemoglobin, which can hold oxygen and allow muscle cells to undergo to tolerate certain um, periods of ischemia. Um, and that myoglobin uh, gets released when muscles are damaged as well. Um, so it is not quite as specific as the uh, CKMB and the troponin. So the CKMB and the troponin um, tend to be the ones that we look at. Right. Talk about myoglobin. We've talked about rhabdomyolysis uh, before, right? This is breakdown of muscle. CK and myoglobin tends, tend to elevate here. Um, and uh, this can clog up the kidneys, right? It's very harmful to the kidneys. And so tea colored or maroon colored urine uh, is a classic finding of this. And so we need to flush the patient with fluids. Uh, force their kidneys to continue working so they don't completely fail. Um, another common cardiac test is something called the BNP that stands for brain natriuretic peptide. That's a molecule that's released by the ventricles if they get overstretched. And so this is an indicator of heart failure. Uh, generally greater than 100, a BNP greater than 100 suggests that somebody is in heart failure. Uh, we've talked about the anion gap already, so I won't spend a whole lot of time here. We've already talked about why it's important. We've talked about mud piles differentials for an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, we've also talked about serum osmolality. All right. And we've talked about osmolality versus osmolarity as well as uh, solute and solvent. All right, there is something called the osmolar gap. We mentioned that, that's the difference between the calculated osmolality and the measured. And so um, you calculate it and, we, and we've gone over that formula already. And then you look at what's actually measured on the lab test, right? And the difference is the gap. And if there's a very large gap, generally greater than 10, that suggests that there's some toxin typically that is causing that that elevated gap um, many of the same things on the mud piles mnemonic are the same things that can cause an elevated osmolar gap um, there's the there's a formula why there we go there's a formula but well, we've talked about that already 
All right. These are some of the common causes of an osmolar gap, toxic alcohols. We talked about those already, though. Um, we've also talked about ABG interpretation. So I think I'll just uh, kind of go through this real quickly. These are the normal values. Remember, the pH has a normal range, but perfectly normal pH is 7.4. And we went through uh, Henderson Hasselbach and all of its gory detail to get to the normal pH. All right, ABG, everybody knows that. All right, so nothing new there. Uh, as far as alterations go, nothing new there as well. All right, and that's that. So that just kind of filled in, hopefully filled in some of the gaps, like pancre the pancreas, um, coagulation profiles and some of the cardiac enzymes. So those, there are many, many other labs, uh, but that is just, these are just some of the most important and most common labs that you're gonna encounter in the clinical environment. So you just need to have a, an understanding of what they mean, what they suggest. You don't actually have to memorize for the most part, you don't even have to memorize normal values because they will tell you what's high or low on the lab printout. Now, when it comes to ABGs and acid-base analysis, you have to remember that um, because that's testable material. Um, but as far as all the other labs go, you generally are going to be given the value in what's, what's high or low, or you will be told that this is an elevated or a low value, and then you'll have to figure out what the implications are of that. So I wouldn't expect you to spend a whole lot of time memorizing, you know, what's the What's the normal BUN, normal creatinine? What's the normal amylase? What's the normal lipase, right? Because you can reference that on the lab uh, printout. So that brings us to the next thing I want to talk about, and that's radiology. Um, and this isn't going to be specific to radiology. This is going to be more of a diagnostic imaging discussion. So when we, we talk about radiology, radiology is a specific branch of diagnostic imaging that focuses on x-rays. Um, this includes your standard x-rays, and this also includes the CT scan, or something referred to as a, commuted, a computed tomography. CT scanning is just a fancy type of x-ray. It's, it's actually shooting multiple x-ray beams in a circle around a person, and so the view that you get is very different from just a standard x-ray, um, but it all is x-ray technology. Um, there's also something called MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And MRI essentially takes advantage of the quantum nature, uh, specifically of hydrogen atoms in your body. And um, I've mentioned this before, but remember when I talked about the concept of spin? and how certain quantum particles can have certain spin states, which are kind of like a little, they, they essentially are like little bar magnets and they have this little, little bit of angular momentum that's kind of oriented in a, in a certain way. Um, that's the most intuitive way you could think about spin. And we talk about it as either spin up or spin down or plus one half or minus one half. Um, and that's more or less just to help us conceptualize it. but. Um, uh, atoms themselves can have spin as well. And when you put somebody in a strong magnetic field, the spin of certain atoms um, can align in the direction of that magnetic field. And then if you pulse that field or you perturb that field, they, um, the atoms that have aligned to that will will, um, you know, you'll, you'll pulse the field or you'll change the magnetic field and they'll realign or they'll move their spins. And when they do that, they release energy in the form of radio waves. And then we can detect those radio waves being released by the, the atoms and molecules in the specific tissue that we're imaging. And we can produce an image that's magnetic resonance imaging. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, clearly, that's not an x-ray, but it's a, still a type of imaging. And then, of course, there is something called ultrasound, where you're using um, sound waves. You're actually shooting sound waves into structures of the body 
And then those sound waves bounce off, come back to the detector and you can produce an image that way. So that's primarily what we'll be talking about. And it'll just be the, the, the very basic concepts just to give you an understanding. And we'll talk about some of the common types of pathology that you might see on a certain radiological study. So I'm just gonna pull up that. And again, this lecture has been loaded into uh, Canvas for you all. So you can download it, reference it, print it off if you want. All right, here's radiology. All right, here we go. So what is x-ray? Well, it essentially involves shooting x-ray through the body, right? You take a, a, a plate, a photographic plate, and put it behind the person and shoot an x-ray from the front to the back, or you put the plate in front of the patient and you shoot the x-ray from the back to the front. And if you do that, that is called a PA x-ray, a posterior to anterior, or if you shoot through the front to the back, that's called an AP x-ray, an anterior posterior x-ray. Um, and x-rays are a form of high energy light. They're high energy photons um, and they can get absorbed. And the way that it works is the more dense a material is, the more x-rays get absorbed. And that's called attenuation, right? So dense materials in your body will absorb more x-rays. And so if you have a photographic plate behind somebody and then you're shooting x-rays through that person, what happens is the tissues in that person's body that are, do not have density, they are very low attenuating, the x-rays tend to go right through those tissues. They don't get absorbed and they impact, the x-rays impact the photographic plate and wherever the x-rays hit, the plate darkens, it turns black. Now, if an x-ray instead goes through a dense part of the body that absorbs that x-ray like a bone or a thick collection of blood, then the x-ray gets absorbed. It doesn't make it through the body and the area on the photographic plate stays white. So when you see white on a photograph, what you're seeing is you're seeing a lack of x-rays hitting the, the, uh, the, the, the plate or the detector. Right, so an x-ray is really a shadow, right? Because the bones tend to absorb the x-rays and that produces a shadow of the bones because the black part of the x-ray is actually caused by the x-rays that get through and strike the plate, all right? So low versus high attenuation, low tends to be black. So think of air, so air-filled spaces in your body have very low attenuation. Moderate attenuation kind of shades of gray. Think of like muscle, um, muscle, subcutaneous tissue, things like that tends to be moderate. And then high attenuation tissues, think of, of bones or if the patient has like implanted devices. Uh, so here we have a picture um, of a um, fork fracture, which is common in kids. Um, so you can see, right out here, this is all black. And that makes sense because there's nothing but air. So the x-ray just passes right through the air and then hits the detector. And so this all turns black. And then right in here, you have shades of gray. You're looking at the subcutaneous, um, the muscular tissue, um, the fascia and all that. And so that absorbs some x-rays. And then you see the white of the bone here very high attenuation tissue that is absorbing lots of x-rays. All right, so these are some of the things we'll talk about, the chest x-ray, soft tissue neck. We'll talk about the CT scan, which is just a special kind of x-ray. Uh, we'll also talk about the FAST exam, which is, is not an x-ray, that is a, an ultrasound. But there are many EMS services and systems that are beginning to use this as a part of their diagnostic workup, particularly of trauma patients. So I at least want you to be aware of it. I want you to know kind of how it works and be aware of some of the terminology around it. All right, so we're not making you expert radiologists here, all right? I just want you to be able to recognize common serious problems 
allow you to make better decisions. All right, all people are created equal. Not all x-rays are cre created equal. So quality of the x-rays are very important as well. Low quality films are gonna be of limited value. All right, so the most common x-ray that we run into in the emergency setting is the chest x-ray. The most common is the AP chest. And again, that's where the x-ray device comes in front of the patient, shoots x-rays through the chest. Those x-rays go through the chest and hit the detector or the plate behind the patient, anterior to posterior. Um, there's also something called a lateral view where you put a plate here and then you shoot the x-rays through the side or through the lateral aspect of the person. Um, and then that can produce, that can give us Essentially, an x-ray just looks in one plane or it's just one dimension. So if you have the AP and the lateral, you can look at them together to try to, to, try to give yourself a more three-dimension out, some more three-dimensionality uh, to what's going on. Um, you always want to uh, correlate abnormal findings with the patient condition, just like all tests, right? All right, so standard technique for looking at a chest x-ray is the ABCD technique. So you look at the airway and lung first, you identify the, the air column and the trachea, you look for any swelling, any foreign bodies, lung markings and aerations, the lung fields, you look for consolidations or collections of stuff in the lungs that absorb x-rays, that would be abnormal. Then you look at the bones, does everything look symmetrical? Does it look like there are any fractures? You look at the heart, the cardiac window, is it too large? Is it squished down and too small? All right, that's called a narrow or enlarged mediastinum. Um, then you look at the diaphragm. Is the diaphragm pushed down or depressed? Is there air under the diaphragm? And where is that air? And I'll give you just a couple of examples here. So here is a normal PA chest, all right. So right here, you can see that this is darker right in the middle here, because this is the trachea and the trachea should have air in it. And then you can see right here, there's a branching. And that is the trachea branching into the right and left main stem bronchus at the, at the level of the carina. All right, so it's see how it looks nice and straight. And then you can see the lung fields they're not completely black because the lungs aren't completely filled with air, right? There are alveoli that have air in them, but you have lots of other tissue, the type one, and type two alveolar pneumocytes. And so you kind of have this hazy, haziness, which is good, that's the lung. And you can see that it, that haziness kind of fills out the entire hemithorax on both sides, right? And those are normally expanded lungs. Those are good lung fields. And it looks a little darker right in here. We have a lot more air. All right. So, so far, so good. We look at the heart. Um, the heart should be no more than 50% of the entire uh, length of the mediastinum should be no more than 50% of the entire length of the, the thorax. Um, or width rather, um, the general rule of thumb is nine centimeters. It shouldn't be wider than nine centimeters at the mediastinum, uh, let's see here, right, right in here. Um, and so standard thing people used to do back when these were very common was a pager. Your standard pager was about nine centimeters in length and you could put a pager up there and is it wider or narrower than the pager? If it's wider than that, that might indicate that there's some disruption with the trachea where you have blood leaking in and the mediastinum is widened out. A heart, the cardiac silhouette, if it's greater than 50% of the width of the chest, that means that the heart is enlarged and you're worried about heart failure. Um, you can see the diaphragm looks normal here and you've got a nice sharp angle right here and a nice sharp angle here. These are acute angles and these are called the costophorinic angles. That's normal. Um, and then you see you've got just a little bit of air underneath the diaphragm right here. That's actually normal to see air there. Air pretty much anywhere else under the diaphragm is abnormal, right? But that right there is 
fairly normal, that's just air in the stomach. That's what we call the gastric bubble. So that's really the only place you should see air underneath the diaphragm. All right, so here's just another look at a normal AP chest. So you see you've got your tracheal air column here and it's a little gray because it's got air. And then you see it coming, taking off, branching out here and here into the right and left main stem bronchus. Now these little hazy patches right here, this is an area called the hilum of the lungs where you have lots of blood vessels coming in and out of the lungs. So you've got the pulmonary arteries and veins. And then you've got lots of little lymph nodes in there as well. And so that does produce kind of this, this, this structure here, which is fairly normal. You see the little bump there. That's the aortic notch. The heart looks good. Um, you've got sharp costophrenic angles. You've got your gastric bubble underneath the diaphragm. So everything looks symmetrical. So this is more or less a normal PA chest. There's a lateral or side view. This is really good if you have fluid inside of the chest and you want to look at fluid levels. All right, so just look at some problems. Pneumonia, it produced, so pneumonia is an infection of the parenchyma of the lung itself. Um, and so what you want to look for is a consolidation or a, an area of dense material in a specific area of the lung. Um, Typically, pneumonias start in one area and then they can spread to other areas. Occasionally, people can get what's called a bilateral pneumonia. Um, and pneumonias tend to start in the lower lobes, the more dependent areas of the lungs, and then work up. Upper lobe pneumonias are, are far less common. And you want to think of aspiration if you see upper lobe consolidations, specifically on the right, right? A right upper lobe pneumonia is uh, much, is, is suggestive of aspiration pneumonia. So here we have a consolidation. So you see how this material right here is much wider, right? It's much wider than the gray expanded lung around it. So you have consolidation. You essentially have infection right in here. So this would be a middle lobe um, pneumonia. This would be a right middle lobe pneumonia. And you can see that you have the marker up here that differentiates the right versus left side of the patient. So this would be a right middle lobe pneumonia that we're looking at. Pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is blood in the pleural space that pushes the lung away, or, or air, excuse me, that pushes the lung away. So what you're gonna have is you're not gonna have that kind of mixture of gray and dark that you see with a normal lung field, the lung will be pushed out of the way and you'll have a very, very dark area. Um, and you should, you often see shifting of structures away from that air. Um, so when you have air in your chest, it tends to push stuff away. And when you have fluid in the lung, that tends to pull towards. All right, so here you can see, it's just completely black in here. And then you've got the shriveled up remnant of the lung right here. So that'd be a large right-sided pneumothorax that, you, that we're looking at there. All right, here we have a tension pneumothorax. So the diaphragm is pushed down. See how it's, it's pushed further down on the, on the, uh, on the, the left side here uh, versus the right. Okay, and you've got remnants of that collapsed lung. And look at this, you actually have shifting of that air column, right? So you have shifting of the air column. Now the trachea itself, the trachea is still midline, right? And I know you probably all learned that tracheal shifting is a sign of uh, tension pneumothorax, but it's a pretty rare finding really. And it's a very late finding. Um, so you have mediastinal shifting going on with this patient, but no tracheal shifting because you really have to shift things far to actually get that trachea to shift, right? Uh, hemothorax um, kind of resembles pneumonia because you've got blood in the thoracic cavity uh, collecting and it, it absorbs x-rays. So it can look a lot like a pneumonia. Um, or something called a pleural effusion, which is a collection of fluid in the pleural space. Uh, may not be blood, 
Uh, often pleural effusions are due to either infections or heart failure. Those are like the most common causes of pleural effusions. If it's infection, the pathophysiological process is called um, uh, transidative um, or um, exudative, sorry. Exudative processes cause um, infective pleural effusions, whereas transidate, essentially you have increase in hydrostatic pressure pushing fluid across membranes out into the thoracic cavity or in the, into the pleural cavity more specifically. And that is what we call a transidative process. Um, and it may even resemble something called an empyema. And an empyema is a word that means a big pus pocket. So it's essentially, it's a, um, it's a big collection of pus in the pleural cavity. Um, now, if it occurs in the lung tissue itself, we would call that a, um, a lung abscess. Um, but in the pleural cavity, we would call that an empyema. Um, so here you have a hemothorax. So you have this collection of blood that's causing this whitening here as it's absorbing x-rays. Looks a lot like a lower lobe pneumonia. So, history and fit, so the history is going to guide us one way or the other. So here we have a PA and a lateral chest. Um, so you can see you've got lots of blood here on this side. And then you can see some of that here is, is whitening on the, the lateral. All right, pleural effusion looks a lot like a hemothorax. You have this really nice fine layer right here. Um, essentially that's the surface of the fluid and it's just whited out right here. All right, uh, tracheal tube depth. So after you have um, confirmed placement of an endotracheal tube in the trachea with capnography and other methods, uh, an x-ray cannot be used, and this is important for you all to understand, to never let a, a, a provider tell you the tube is in the right place based on an x-ray, okay? Do not allow that to ever happen because you could have a dead patient on your hands. All right. So use carbon dioxide monitoring, lung sounds, pulse oximetry, et cetera. We'll talk about all that stuff in, in, in uh, pulmonology and airway management later on in the course. But once you've confirmed that the tube is in the trachea, then you can get an x-ray to see how deep the tube is. And the reason that, the, that an x-ray can't tell you where, where tell you that the tube is in the trachea is the trachea is right in front of the esophagus. And your standard x-ray only looks in one plane, right? So you could put an endotracheal tube in the trachea or the esophagus, and it will look exactly the same on your standard AP or PA x-ray, right? Because you don't have three-dimensionality to it. But once you confirm placement in the trachea, you know it's in the trachea, then you can get an x-ray and figure out how deep into the trachea it is. Uh, so in this x-ray, you can see that most medical devices that get placed into body um, orifices like endotracheal tubes, gastric tubes, et cetera, have a line in them. And this is what's known as a radio opaque marker, right? So even like supraglottic airways will have this. So there's a marker, there's a line built into the device that absorbs x-rays and produces a white line. That's called the radio opaque marker. And so that's what we're looking at here is the radio opaque marker of the endotracheal tube. And you can see that it ends right here. And you can see the carina right here. And you've got your right and left main stem bronchus branching off here. And you ideally want the tip of the endotracheal tube about two centimeters or an inch above the carina. That would be ideal placement of that endotracheal tube. Uh, this is an x-ray. This is actually a patient that I um, flew. Um, this was somebody who was all in an altercation 
and sustained a head injury and was intubated due to altered mental status and inability to protect airway. Um, and we took over care. Uh, actually, this, interestingly enough, you're going to meet the other half of the team. Um, he is going to be one of your main lab. Uh, he's going to be with me in the lab, a guy by the name of Ronell Sizer, who is actually still actively flying uh, full time as a flight medic, but he works part time for the college. Um, we both took care of this patient. Um, so what do you all notice? Anybody notice anything interesting about this x-ray? Branching out to the side, so probably main stem? Yep, this is a right Branch. main stem. Right. Yep, got it. So you can clearly see, this is actually a really decent quality x-ray, so you can clearly see the radio opaque marker there, right? So the radio opaque marker's in here, and so it's well below the carina, and so it has actually gone into the right main stem um, bronchus here. And that's exactly what we've got is a right main stem intubation. Um, and we were able to, uh, we did not intubate this patient. This patient was intubated in, by an emergency physician. And we happened to notice that. And you can see, see how the diaphragm is very high up here versus it's a little lower on this side. Um, normally what you would see here, this is kind of interesting, and some of this is due to the, the patient was, when they shot the x-ray, the patient was kind of, move, wasn't in ideal because obviously the patient was supine uh, when this x-ray was shot. Um, but normally what you would see is you'd see over expansion of this side and under expansion of this side. You don't really see that very well here. And I suspect the reason why is this just, this was like very shortly after uh, the intubation. So we we were able to rapidly identify it. We were able to pull that endotracheal tube back and we um, made some different changes on our ventilator as well. But yeah, it cut, but a really good example of a, of a, of a right main stem intubation uh, on an x-ray. Okay, aortic tears and leaking dissections tend, tend to cause a widened mediastinum. So the mediastinum widens out as blood fills in there and you lose the ability to see the aortic notch. So it looks a lot like that. So you have this very wide mediastinum here. It's all full of blood. You don't have the aortic notch here. Um, that is very concerning. That is a patient who may be very critical if they're not already. Congestive heart failure com produces some very characteristic changes on um, the x-ray as well. Um, so first of all, you're gonna have a very large heart, cardiomegaly, so the cardiac uh, shadow gets large. And then you tend to have a backup of blood, particularly if the left side of the heart is failing, into the lungs. And that's gonna cause the blood vessels of the lungs to engorge and they'll produce kind of like this wing-like pattern in the lungs, right? So the pulmonary vessels, the pulmonary, um, the pulmonary arteries will be kind of, as blood's backing up and then they'll engorge out and it'll kind of look like, like angel wings or some people call this bat, bat wing sign or butterfly sign, right? And, and this is uh, technically referred to as curly A and curly B lines. Um, as those vessels engorge and fill up with um, fluid. Um, so here's an extreme example of that, right? It's very white. And then you have all these projections, these white projections coming out. Um, and those are all pulmonary, the pulmonary, pulmonary vasculature and blood backing up into that, just kind of producing like, if you really use your imagination, kind of like angel wings coming out from around the mediastinum. Asthma. So somebody has asthma, severe COPD, um, and they're retaining air, so they're not able to exhale air very effectively. What happens is you get air trapping, and so the lungs hyperinflate, that pushes the diaphragm down and it squeezes the heart. And that's why sometimes severe asthma attacks and COPD, they can get hypotensive because you're putting pressure on the heart, particularly the right side of the heart, and the blood coming into the heart, the preload is decreased, and that decreases the cardiac output. Kind of this similar mechanism to what you would see with the tension pneumothorax. So here you have a, it kind of looks like a pneumothorax, um, but you have overexpanded air, 
or overexpanded lungs. There's too much air in the lungs. You've got a very narrow mediastinum. You can barely see the cardiac notch there. And the heart's kind of squished. And look at the diaphragm. It's boom, boom, being pushed down. <laughs> so that's a indicative of um, severe obstructive pathology, asthma attack, COPD exacerbation, things of that nature. All right. Um, I do also want to talk about um, ARDS or acute, uh, used to be called adult. We tend to call it acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, pathology is a little complex, tends to uh, something that can cause a lung injury, and then you have lots of inflammation, and then that causes uh, further uh, damage, loss of um, membrane integrity, um, and it produces something referred to as a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where you have the lungs filling up with fluid. It's not due to the heart failing, though. It's due to um, the integrity of the uh, alveolar capillary membrane breaking down. Um, so these patients get hypoxemic. You have to give them more oxygen, and they tend to get worse. And there's usually an underlying precipitating cause. They, they're involved in a trauma. They had pancreatitis, a severe infection, sepsis, septic shock, MODs, SIRS, um, and so on, right? There's some sort of insult. And then typically within one to, one to three days after that insult is when they really start developing this pathology. Um, we see this in um, some people with uh, COVID as well. So ARDS produces diffuse infiltrates. So where pneumonia tends to be isolated, right? A consolidation infiltrate, this produces bilateral infiltrates and it kind of looks like um, grinding glass with sandpaper. And so people call this a ground glass pattern or a reticular granular pattern. If you see those words in reference to an X-ray on a test question, you automatically want to think, oh, they're talking about ARDS. Just like if you see curly A, curly B, bat wing sign, enlarged heart, you want to think, oh, that's congestive heart failure. If you see consolidation, you want to be thinking, okay, they're talking about pneumonia there, right? So you can see these, these, these key words um, should push you to think uh, one way or another. So here you go. You have these just, right, just this whitish stuff all over the place. These lungs are filled with fluid bilaterally, really bad. You can see the patient is intubated as well. Nasty stuff. Here's another example of it, right? It's all fluffy everywhere on both sides. Nasty stuff. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, we'll keep going for a couple more minutes. Um, another x-ray that we do um, oftentimes on kids um, is a soft tissue of neck. And what we're doing is we're looking for swelling or edema of the soft tissues of the neck, looking for blood collections. Um, so there are two things that I want to talk about specifically that we can look for on a soft tissue neck, and that is epiglottitis. And you'll see a swollen epiglottis, and it looks like a thumb. Like sometimes you imagine somebody sticking a thumb <laughs> In, 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 the, in the neck on the x-ray, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, so here's a picture of it. All right, so you've got the epiglottis right here swollen. And if you use your imagination, it's like someone's stuck their thumb in there in the neck and it's swollen. Um, does anyone know what this white structure is right here? Oh, go back. Me, yeah. Isn't that the this, floating bone? What's that? Yep. The yep. Hyoid? That's a hyoid bone. That's actually normal. Yeah. You do have a little bone. So you, you got the hyoid bone there. Um, so that's actually normal. But this swelling right here, this bulge that you can see, that's epiglottitis right there. Um, now, interestingly enough, epiglottitis is not really common in kids. Probably a lot of you learned about it as being a common childhood illness, but it's actually not. Um, because the, the common organism, the most common causative organism, and let me ask you all the question, is epiglottitis primarily viral or bacterial?
It's one of those classic test questions. Is epiglottitis bacterial or viral? We're going to be bacterial. Yep. Yep. Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenzae, it's a gram positive uh, cocci, uh, is the most common cause of um, epiglottitis. And interestingly enough, the reason it's not so common in kids currently is that most children are vaccinated. They receive the HIB, the HIV, the Haemophilus influenzae B um, vaccine. So uh, it actually tends to be more common in adult patients. In fact, I have only ever seen epiglottitis in adults in my career. Um, and then the other major problem is croup, also known as tracheolaryngeal bronchitis. So it is an inflammation of the trachea, the larynx, and the bronchi. Let me ask you the question, is croup primarily a viral or a bacterial phenomenon? I would say viral on this one. Yep. Croup is like 90% of the time it's viral. In fact, over 90% of the time, bronchitis and upper respiratory infections in general tend to be viral. Um, so what can happen here is you can get upper airway swelling. Um, and this tends to be more common in kids because kids have a narrower conical, conically shaped airway. Um, and so they don't tolerate narrowing of the airway as well as an adult, which is uh, their airway tends to be more columnar in, sh in its shape. And so this produces what's known as the steeple sign. Um, so think of the, the tip, the top of a steeple and how it kind of comes to a sharp top there. And so you can see that right here in this x-ray. So you got your tracheal air column and then see how it narrows up here uh, toward the larynx. Um, toward the superior aspect of the laryngeal uh, cartilage there. Um, and this tends to be the narrowest part of the airway of the kid in general. Um, and that is the steeple sign, a uh, classic finding for uh, croup. Okay, let's see, it's 9.30 already. So I think what we'll do is we will take a break and we'll finish up talking about uh, CT scans uh, and I do want to spend a few minutes talking about the FAST exam as well. Uh, so are there any questions before we take our first break? Anybody have any questions? All right. I've got 9.32. So I'll see you all back at 9.47. Treatment. The treatment's going to vary, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on what the cause is, okay. right? If it's, for example, if it's EKA, right? If it's diabetic ketoacidosis, yeah, you're going to give you know, fluids. That's mm -hmm. a primary treatment for that. If it's, a, if it's like a methanol or a, a ethylene glycol poisoning, you know, there are antidotes like fomepazole that you need to give. Um, if it's uh, if it's, um, uremia, you know, they're going to need dialysis. Um, so the, the, the specific treatment is going to depend on the, the cause of the, uh, anion gap acidosis. Okay. And that, that thing that includes the, uh, diabetes insipidus as well, correct? No, diabetes insipidus is, is actually a, um, is a hormonal issue, uh, related to, uh, antidiuretic hormone. Oh, okay where um, essentially you don't, you're not making enough of it. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you start losing water because antidiuretic hormone is an antidiuretic. It, when you have it, it prevents you from, from urinating it essentially or prevents, it causes your kidneys to hold on to water, um, your body to hold on to more water. And so when you have a decrease in ADH, you can, you start losing more water than normal. Okay. Yeah, and that's called diabetes insipidus. And like you were saying, it just depends on the history that we get, correct, to decipher between both of them? Yeah. We're going to talk about that in, in great detail. You're going to have, we're, you're going to have a whole um, endocrinology lecture during the medical block, and we'll talk about diabetes insipidus and syndrome of any appropriate antidiuretic hormone and, and that. Um, so we will go into some more detail there. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
All right, everyone. Well, we're back. And uh, let me go ahead and pick up where we left off. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, CT scans or commuted to uh, computed tomography. And I just said it's essentially a fancy x-ray. All right, so this is a standard a head injury assessment is to do a CT of the head. And this is where we tend to see these. And what you do is you want to look essentially for things to look uniform and symmetrical. And when you have a loss of symmetry is, is where you want to focus and go, okay, is there an issue here? And typically what will happen is if you have swelling of the brain, you have a large tumor, or you have a collection of blood, a hematoma, that will push stuff out of the way. And that's what we call mass effect. So whenever you see mass effect, that is some lesion that is pushing stuff out of the way. And the midline of the brain in severe cases of mass effect will shift. That's what we call midline shifting. Um, now, acute ischemia, like if someone has an acute uh, ischemic injury to the brain due to hypoperfusion or low oxygen levels, um, that's actually not immediately visible on a CT scan. Um, so um, that kind of stuff will be hard to pick up on a CT scan. And things like DAI or diffuse axonal insult, which, which are things we'll talk about in more detail later on, um, tend not to present on your CT scans. So here's a normal CT scan. Um, and actually you, you look at it, basically it takes different slices every, every and you can set how many millimeters between slice. Um, so you're actually gonna have several slices through the head. So this is just one slice we're looking at, but this is essentially normal. So here's the midline right here, and you can see that it looks good. And more or less what you see on one side, you see on the other, right? That's called symmetry in these um, dark areas here are actually um, ventricles um, deep within the brain filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, this is part of the, of, of the, these are part of the cerebral aqueducts as well. Um, and you can see a white spot here, a white spot here. These are little calcifications that can occur. So this is probably someone who's a little older, but you see it's bilateral. So you still have that symmetry. Um, however, you can clearly see that there is something that is whiter here. So this is something that is dense, denser than the brain tissue, and it is absorbing x-rays. So this is a collection of blood more than likely. Um, and it is pushing, and you can see how the midline is shifted away from that and is pushing structures away from it. And that's what we call mass effect with midline shift. All right. There are different types of hematomas, and we will talk about these in a lot more detail. Subdural hematomas tend to be venous bleeding under the dura, and it looks like a crescent moon, kind of has a crescent shape to it. And subdural hematomas can be acute, subacute, or even chronic. Um, so you can get varying, you can get fresh. So the wider it is, the fresher it is. And this right here is the skull. This is the cranium here around the brain. But underneath it, um, you can see that this is this is lighter than this in here. So you this is older blood and this is newer blood, essentially what we're looking at. Uh, salt and pepper appearance. So you've got some older stuff here and some newer stuff right in here. Epidural hematoma is arterial. It's under right underneath the dura, dura instead of on, on, on or epidurals on top of the dura and subdurals right underneath the dura. Um, and this tends to be caused by a blow to the side of the head, to the temporal area. There's a large artery called the middle meningeal artery. And when that artery gets compromised or ruptured, that can cause a rapid bleed, um, typically, and that's a typical cause in an epidural hematoma. And so the epidural hematoma looks like a lens, kind of like a cat's eye. It has a lensate shape to it versus a crescent moon shape, like the subdural hematoma. And you can see that this is right over the temporal area. Um, you have intracerebral hematomas. This is bleeding within the parenchyma of the brain itself. So here you have a deep intracerebral and, and you can see ventricle here and the ventricle here is full of blood. And then there's something called a subarachnoid hemorrhaging, which is bleeding underneath the arachnoid membrane. You remember the meninges form a pad of protection around the brain. So the outer 
meningi is the, or the outer uh, the meningi that covers the brain directly is the pia mater. And then the middle layer is the arachnoid. And then the outermost meningi that, that comes into contact with the skull is the dura mater or tough mother is literally what that means. So the subarachnoid hemorrhage, typically what happens is you fill up the subarachnoid space with blood and that creates a starfish pattern as the cisterns within the brain fill up. Trauma can cause, this is also caused by rupture of various cerebral aneurysms at the base of the brain called berry aneurysms. And so here you can see this spider-like starfish pattern with these little legs coming out right here, right here, right here. And see how this is wider. So these are the cisterns filling up with blood here. Classic subarachnoid hemorrhaging. All right, cervical spine x-ray. We do these in, in trauma patients to look for uh, fractures of the cervical spine. All right, unfortunately, um, you can have unstable injuries where you destroy, tear ligaments. And so you have unstable, an unstable neck and they may not show up on a, a standard cervical spine x-ray, particularly in kids. Um, there's actually a phenomena known as skioria that stands for spinal cord um, injury without radiographic abnormality because kids have a lot more soft tissue and the soft tissue is very stretchy. And so you can actually have a spinal cord injury and a completely normal looking um, spinal x-ray. All right, so typically what we'll do is we'll do a lateral C-spine. Some people call this a cross table C-spine. As the patient is in a supine position, you can shoot the, the x-ray across the table that they're on and at least get a quick view of the, um, the C-spine. Essentially what you're looking for is you're looking for seven cervical vertebrae on top of the first uh, thoracic vertebrae, and that's called seven on one. Um, the, uh, there is a bone that is not easily visualized or not completely visualized. Um, and this is called the odontoid bone um, to look at the first cervical vertebrae because it's very high up near the base of the skull. And so what we'll do is we'll open the person's mouth, shoot a, uh, an x-ray, and that's called the odontoid or open mouth view to look at the odontoid bone or the first cervical vertebrae. So here's uh, a normal looking lateral C-spine. So you've got seven cervical vertebrae. So here is the, um, the body. And then this is a little extension that comes out the posterior aspect known as a spinous process. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then on top of the first thoracic vertebrae there. And you should have three lines, essentially. You have an anterior line here, a posterior line here, and this middle lateral line. And they should all more or less be straight lines. Um, and these are the three lines you look at. And if there are abnormalities in those, um, then that suggests that you have uh, possible fractures. And you can actually see right up here, very high up, you have a little dark opening here, right? Um, and you actually have a little fracture here. And you can see that this line is not totally straight. Um, so here we're looking at a C3, C4 fracture. So one, two, three, four, right in here. And you can see how this vertebrae here is out of a line, the body of the vertebrae here is out of alignment with these other. So you see how this kind of comes out of alignment. Some people refer to that as a step off. And sometimes you can feel that when you do a NAC exam, you can feel that abnormality. Um, in this case, it probably be pretty hard to appreciate. You can see that this patient has a C collar on, right? You can see a little bit of the shadow of that absorbing some of the x-rays. So there's a C collar on here. So you've got a, this is probably a fairly unstable injury that we're looking at. And then the last thing I want to mention is the FAST exam. And this is a type of ultrasound or sonography. It is not radiographic, but rather it uses sound. Um, high frequency sound waves or ultrasound. 
And the FAST exam stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography in Trauma. And it is used to assess for the presence of internal injuries, uh, specifically bleeding within the abdominal pelvic cavity or collections of blood around the heart, um, um, effusions of the heart or tamponades, pericardial tamponade. All right. So how's fast it performed? Well, we tend to look at four different areas with the, with the probe. We look underneath the xiphoid process. It's called a sub xiphoid view underneath the xiphoid process and you shoot up and you're looking at the heart there. Then you look in the right upper quadrant, you're looking at an area called Morrison's pouch. It's an area between the liver and kidney that can fill up with blood when you have abdominal hemorrhage, specifically on the right side. And then you look in the left upper quadrant at something referred to as a splenal renal recess and uh, the paracolic gutter. And both of these are areas where you uh, tend to get splenic. So, you know, the spleen is a major organ on the, in the right upper quadrant that can bleed when traumatized, whereas the liver um, in the right upper quadrant. And then we'll look in the suprapubic area that's above the pubis symphysis um, at Douglas's pouch. And this is the lowest or most dependent area of the abdominal cavity where blood can collect. All right, so here's a normal right upper quadrant. So this is the probe right here. So this is the probes. So this is what you're seeing. So right here, this mass here is the liver actually. And then right here is the kidney that you're looking at. So here's an abnormal right upper quadrant. So here's the liver. Here's the right kidney, and you can see this dense. So this is the opposite of an X-ray. So dense material on ultrasound will be darker than the surrounding normal tissue. So you can, because it's, it's absorbing, um, right? It's absorbing the, um, the sound. So it's denser here. You got blood and you got a little clot that's formed there. All right, sub xiphoid looking under the, the uh, xiphoid uh, process up at the heart. So here's the probe and here's the heart. You can see valves as well. This is a normal view, more or less. This is an abnormal sub xiphoid view. So here you've got the heart. I'll outline that for you here. And then here you have the pericardium. And normally the pericardium should be right, right attached directly to the heart. And so you have is you have this collection of fluid right here between the pericardium and the epicardium of the heart, right? And so this would be, in this case, is a large collection of blood. Uh, this is a normal left upper quadrant. So you've got the spleen right here and the left kidney over here. So this is abnormal. All right, so the spleen is right here. The kidney is right in here. And then you have this large collection of, of free fluid, probably blood due to injury of the spleen. And then finally, the suprapubic. So here's the probe just above the pubis symphysis. So right here, this dark area is actually not a blood collection, but this is actually the bladder. Right, this is a urinary bladder with some urine in it. All right, so you've got loops of bowel here. You've got your bladder with urine in it, but then you just have this large abnormal collection of blood right in here. So you can see that the, um, the FAST exam is a good way if, if you have a trauma patient and you're, and you're kind of, you're trying to make a decision as to where to take this patient. Uh, what kind of uh, resources do they need? Um, the FAST exam provides you additional information. You go, oh, look at this. You know, I've got free, I've got free fluid in the abdominal cavity. There's a history of trauma. This is clearly a patient that is going to need uh, possible trauma surgery eval. I'm going to go to this trauma center. Um, so it helps us make decisions. Um, there are many pitfalls, right? You can have hemorrhage inside organs themselves. 
and organs are covered in a capsule, you know, like the heart has the pericardium, um, the brain is covered in the meninges, many of your other organs are covered in, um, you know, capsules, protective linings, bones, right, are covered in uh, periostum. Um, so you can have a hemorrhage that can occur in the capsule and it's kind of contained. Uh, we, this is common, like the liver, sometimes the kidney as well, you get a capsule or hemorrhage. This can occur very early on. The FAST exam is not great at the retroperitoneal, right? The retroperitoneal cavity is not easily looked at in the FAST exam. So if you have retroperitoneal bleeding from, uh, say, kidney injury or sometimes a pancreas, um, the pancreas is a, an interesting organ because it kind of starts in the abdomen and then kind of goes out into the tail of the pancreas, actually penetrates into the retroperitoneal cavity. Um, and then the biggest pitfall, of course, is operator education and training. It takes a lot to learn how to do these, how to interpret them, and then you need to be doing lots of them to keep up on your, on your skills. All right, so that's just a basic overview of um, radiographic findings. Can you see encephalopathy? Well, well, so encephalopathy is just, that's just a broad term that means brain dysfunction, right? So um, the, I guess the, I guess the, um, the broad answer to that question is yes, right? If, if you have a large epidural hematoma that's causing the brain to dysfunction, then, then yeah, you, you can. But there are other types of encephalopathy like hepatic encephalopathy where um, you're not gonna see the ammonia <laughs> um, causing brain dysfunction with a CT scan or um, any of that. Uh, but certainly if, if the, the encephalopathy is due to uh, a mass effect lesion, then yeah, you would likely be able to see that on uh, specifically the CT scan. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Good deal. All right. Any other questions? Right. Cool. Well, there are a few other things I want to uh, get through. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about risk factors for diseases. And, 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 the, and the textbook actually gives you several examples of diseases, some of which we've actually talked about. I'll leave that to the reading, but I just want to be a little more general in this, this discussion today and just talk about the general differences between uh, certain risk factors. So let me, uh, let me do that here. And I'll go ahead and share this with you all as well. Okay. All right. So when we talk about any disease in particular, or in general, rather, there are two major categories of risk factors. We have what are called modifiable risk factors. These are things that we have some agency to change. And then we have non-modifiable risk factors. These are risk factors that by and large, we do not have the agency to change. So let me just give you all some examples of common modifiable risk factors for many different types of disorders. Uh, so weight is a big one, right? In general, obesity is associated with is a risk factor for many different types of, of pathologies out there. Um, diet physical activity, right? Again, these are all fairly substantial risk factors for many diseases, even something like COVID-19, 
Uh, we know that that people who um, are obese uh, have a poor diet, metabolic syndrome, and have poor activity levels are going to be at higher risk uh, for having complications associated uh, with that with COVID-19 and, and many other diseases for that matter. Um, to some extent, control of blood sugar and control of blood pressure are all modifiable, right? To some extent, right? There are things that we can do uh, to help control these, to help keep them low. Now, non-modifiable risk factors really come down to genetics primarily. Right? We currently don't have the ability to robustly change our genetic profiles. I mean, we are developing technologies uh, such as the CRISPR-Cas9 technologies to be able to um, cut out and in, cut out faulty genes and insert others, and, and you know we're moving the needle in that direction. But currently, we don't have you know any robust ways of of, of drastically changing genetics, um, specifically the phenotypes, um, and of course biological sex. plays a big role in this, right? Uh, biological men and biological women are, are very different in some ways. And there are certain disorders that tend to be more common in bio men versus bio women and vice versa, right? So that is also a very substantial non-modifiable risk factor. And then the last one is age. Again, we currently don't really have the ability to do much about aging as well. So these are just some general examples. And then every disease is going to have its own specific set of modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, right? But these risk factors in general, right? These are the risk factors where many, many different diseases are gonna share these. So when you talk about, when, when the book goes in and it talks about you know, specific examples um, and it talks about, you know, immunologic disorders and cancers and uh, endocrine and cardiovascular disorders, right? Um, each of those disorders are going to have various uh, risk factors. Some of them are going to be much more genetic, right? Like cystic fibrosis, for example, highly genetic. But still, right, if you have cystic fibrosis, and you're morbidly obese, you know, that morbid obesity is going to be a risk factor. Uh, that you might have some agency to modify, uh, even though you can't do anything about the genes, the, the defective uh, chloride, genes that are you know, coding for defective chloride channels. Um, although now we do have some treatments that are, uh, have varying degrees of success depending on the uh, type of cystic fibrosis we're talking about. But be that as it may, hopefully you all can appreciate that. Um, one of the most important kinds of diseases that we run into, of course, is going to be cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer in uh, Western societies like the United States. So I'll just mention that as a special case. And cardiovascular disease really does come down to two major pathophysiological mechanisms, arteriosclerosis, and atherosclerosis. And does anyone know what the difference between arterial and atherosclerosis is? Arterial is the hardening of the vessels and athero is the buildup of plaque. Essentially, yes. Arteriosis is a hardening of the loss of elasticity whereas atherosclerosis is a buildup of plaque deposits. And then over time, yeah, this is, if this, if, if arterial and atherosclerosis is happening in the heart, we call that coronary artery disease or CAD, right? It can happen in other areas of the body, right? It can happen in your limbs. We call that peripheral vascular disease, right? Um, and 
Yeah, and it is a substantial uh, risk factor for many different types of cardiovascular disease, such as um, myocardial infarctions or MIs, right? Or um, OMI is kind of the new term that we see used now. It stands for occlusive myocardial infarction. And does anyone know how that works? So let me just draw. So you've got a vessel here. And that vessel has some degree of, ar of uh, arterial sclerosis. So the blue is kind of hardening. So you got some hardening here. And then you have some plaque deposit here. How do you go from this to a, 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 a myocardial infarction, an acute myocardial infarction? So this is more of a chronic thing. How do you go from that to this? Does anyone know? So the plaque breaks and then the body recognizes the damage. So it sends a clotting factors to it. Good. Yeah. 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 So essentially what you have is you have a rupture of that plaque. It, a, a chunk of it breaks off. And that then initiates... A whole bunch of a whole cascade of events, so to speak, that results in a clot forming inside of that blood vessel. And it is that formation of the clot that causes the acute event. So you go from a chronic event like coronary artery disease to an acute event like an acute myocardial um, infarction. Um, now, if you have substantial atherosclerosis and arterial sclerosis to the point where um, the blood flow is diminished to that vessel and um, you put some stress on say the heart um, and the blood flow through that vessel just can't meet the demands of the heart, um, that produces something else. It's not an acute myocardial infarction, but that is something else that we tend to call ischemia, right? So you can also have ischemia that results And if this is in the heart, right, ischemia due to uh, increased demand, um, this is often referred to as angina pectoris, right? Then the patient relaxes and take nitroglycerin, that tends to go away, right? So that's kind of a chronic manifestation of severe coronary artery disease but the rupture of the plaque and the sudden total occlusion of the vessel is the acute manifestation, is the acute part of it. Um, and you can have this in, right, um, you can have this in your legs, for example, right? You can have a vascular disease in your legs, and when you get up and you walk around um, and those muscles are not getting the blood flow that they want, right, you get pain, and that's called claudication, right? Claudication is like the chronic manifestation, but if you have a plaque that ruptures and a vessel um, in your legs or a clot moves in and you suddenly cut off the circulation to your leg, right? That's what we call an acute arterial occlusion, right? And that produces sudden onset acute limb ischemia. So you have these processes occurring in many er other areas of the body, potentially, not just the heart, right? This happens in the brain with a stroke. Um, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to mention cardiovascular disease is a special case. And we know that there are substantial risk factors for cardiovascular disease, right? Um, we know that, for example, weight, right? Morbid obesity is a risk factor. Um, we know that poor control of blood sugar is a risk factor. Um, because a substantial part of this is also inflammation. Inflammation over time can accelerate the formation of plaque, can flame the vessels, can accelerate the arterial sclerosis that can occur as well. An abnormally elevated blood sugar in the blood is very inflammatory. It tends to cause lots of inflammation. Right? It's very toxic to blood vessels. It's very toxic to nerves. 
And that's where you get all these chronic long-term complications in people that have diabetes mellitus, where their blood sugars are poorly controlled, right? Their blood sugar is high, that causes inflammation and you have neuropathy, right? You have damage to the nerves. So you have loss of sensation in your feet and um, you have damage to the retina of the eyes, get retinopathy, right? So you have a uh, visual loss, right? The chronically elevated blood sugar is very bad on the kidneys as well, right? So you have uh, chronic renal insufficiency and possibly Renal failure is a result of that. Diabetes is a very common cause of renal failure, chronic renal failure, um, and so on and so forth, right? So control of blood sugar is a substantial risk factor, blood pressure as well. And then again, genetics. Some people just have genotypes and phenotypes that are going to put them at higher risk no matter what they do, right? No matter what they do, no matter how much control their weight, no matter how their diet is, how much activity they have, they're just going to be at higher risk uh, for developing certain diseases. Um, biological sex does play a role. Um, in general, men tend to be at higher risk for cardiovascular disease than women until what? Something happens in women, biological women, um, and after this happens, the risk goes up very rapidly and approaches the risk that we see with men. Does Is anyone know? Postmenopausal. Yeah, postmenopausal women um, following menopause, their cardiovascular risk will will start to rise and will kind of asymptote toward what you'd see with men, um, and then of course age. Age tends to be a risk factor for everything and there's nothing we can do about it right now. So, yeah. So many questions about risk factors in general. All right. Um, there's just some other terms I wanna make sure everybody's familiar with. These, these terms are used frequently in term, in, when talking about basically any kind of pathology or disease. All right, and they include the following incidence. All right, prevalence, morbidity, and mortality. So I just wanna make sure we're all clear on the difference between these terms because they do come up from time to time. So what does incidence mean? When we talk about the incidence of a, of a disease, for example, what does that mean? Isn't it like the percentage among a uh, population? No, not the percentage. Just how many times it's happened. No. There you go. Yeah, so it's, it's the number of times it, it, it occurs, or think of it as a new diagnosis, right? How many newly diagnosed people do we have with this condition per a certain period of time? So this may be, uh, typically it's per year, right? Um, but in certain instances, it's particularly if you have lots and lots of new cases, it may be per day or per week, right? We, 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 we've seen this with COVID, right? Um, you know, a few months ago, when we, were, we were going through, uh, well, just a couple months ago, really, when we were going through the uh, peak of the Omicron wave, you know, we were, you know, what, up to around 300,000 300, cases of COVID per day in the United States. That would be an example of incidence, right? So there are 300,000 new cases diagnosed per day. Um, or maybe if you're talking about uh, diabetes, for example, um, you know, there are approximately 2 million uh, people diagnosed with diabetes, type 1 and type 2, uh, per year. Um, so that would be an example of incidence. Now, prevalence 
is more, um, it's not a, it, prevalence isn't um, how many new people are diagnosed, but just how much of this disease is there in the population, right? And so prevalence is the one that is, tends to be reported in a percentage, right? So it's like, okay, incidences, like how many times is this being diagnosed in a certain period of time? Prevalence is, okay, what percentage of the population has this disease at a certain time, right? All right. Um, for example, like diabetes, it's like, I think it's like 9.5-10% of the population of the United States has diabetes, right? Whereas um, approximately 2 million new diagnoses of diabetes per year, right? So hopefully that makes sense what the difference between incident and prevalence is. And what you can have is you can have a disease that has a, um, a very low incidence, but a very high prevalence, right? And you can also have diseases that have a, a very high incidence, but a very low prevalence. So let's think about this. So a disease that has high incidence, So high incidence might be the common cold. Right? I know COVID is really sad right now, but let's just talk about the common cold, right? So, so, um, the dozens of viruses, I can call, including some coronaviruses, but whatever, common cold. So what's the incidence of the common cold? Well, it's basically everybody gets it, right? I mean, it's super common. Uh, I'm just going to guess 80%, right? Um, so 80% of the population will get the common cold. Um, so let's just say that 200 million, 200 million people in the United States will get the common cold per year, all right? That'd be an example of incidents. All right. High incidents, right? But here's the thing. What happens to virtually everybody who gets a common cold? Let me ask that. What happens to virtually everybody who gets a common cold? They get better within like a week or two. They get over it, right? And so the prevalence of the common cold is super low. It's not very prevalent, right? High incidence, but you get over it and it, you know, it doesn't stay in the population. Um, uh, an example of a, of a disease that has um, very fairly low incidence, and I don't know exactly what the incidence is, but it's fairly low, might be something like HIV, right? So it's not like hundreds of millions of people are getting diagnosed with HIV per year, but what happens when you get HIV? Does it go away? No. No. So what happens is over time, the prevalence of HIV has increased. right? Even though the incidence is fairly low, right? If you get it, I mean, you can, you can live decades and decades with HIV. And so what happens is even though the incidence is low over time, as more and more people get infected, an increase in the prevalence, the percentage of population that has it. So that's why it, it, it's important to understand the difference between incidence and prevalence because they can look at different things. And then what's morbidity and mortality? What's that all about? the difference between morbidity and mortality morbidity is more of a chronic thing just being ill mortality is dying from 
Yeah. So, so morbidity, morbidity doesn't necessarily need to be chronic. It can be, but a morbidity is just a, when we say morbid, we just mean a disease manifestation. Right. If I, it, it's, for example, if I get infected with SARS-CoV-2 and I develop a cough, like that's a morbidity, right? I'm, I'm sick. Uh, and you can have really severe morbidities, right? Like severe heart disease, heart failure, um, or fairly benign uh, morbidities. But morbidity in general just means manifestation of the disease, whereas you're right, mortality is death. Yeah. So there are lots of diseases out there that have high morbidity and low mortality. Um, something like diabetes, for example, right? You get diabetes, like type two diabetes. Um, there are lots of morbidity associated with that, right? But you don't die right away. Um, and so the mortality doesn't come until typically decades later after you, you know, you, you have diabetic ulcers and, and nephropathy and neuropathy, and you have all developed all these morbidities going on, and then you end up having mortality. Um, so that's also an important differentiation to understand about um, different uh, diseases as well. All right, we are coming up on our second hour. Uh, are there any questions before we take our next break? All right, well, it's 1030. So let's see here, 1045. I'll see you all back at 1045. So there's just one more, one more thing I wanna talk about uh, and we won't go into super deep detail, um, but it's an important part of uh, a lot of different diseases. Um, certainly it plays a role with immunology and that is uh, blood clotting. Um, specifically, what I want to talk about is the series of events that happen to actually form a blood clot, if you will, and this is encapsulated in a, a concept. It's not a perfect concept. It's not ideal, but it at least allows us to develop some intuition about blood clotting, and it's something referred to as the clotting cascade. And essentially, what the clotting cascade is, is it's you have all of these proteins in your blood and they're all in an inactive form. And then what happens is something happens um, to initiate the cascade in one inactive factor gets converted to an active factor. And then that acts on another inactive factor to convert it into an active factor and so on and so forth down a long chain of inactive to active, inactive to active, inactive to active until you get to the bottom where you essentially have a stable fibrin plug that develops. And so there are a whole bunch of little steps that, that get you to that, that point. And all of those little steps are modulated by clotting factors. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of them and we will return to this concept uh, when we talk about disorders of clotting later on in the paramedic program. So let me just go ahead and share my screen with you all here. All right. I just have a table here. There's actually a pretty good table in your textbook that um, discusses clotting factors. Um, it doesn't lay it out like this in a cascade format. It just talks about the individual starting at factor one all the way to uh, 13, I believe. Um, and this is a table 9-7 in the textbook. So you can use that to supplement this. All right. So essentially what you have with the clotting cascade, you have two specific pathways that meet together in what, what we call the common pathway, but there are two ways that you can activate the clotting cascade. The first way is through what we call the extrinsic system. All right. And this is essentially uh, from damage
outside the blood vessel. Right, so um, essentially you damage around the blood vessel or tissue around the blood vessel. All right, it's extrinsic. Intrinsic is where you have direct damage to the inner lining of the blood vessel. So you have damage to the inner lining, the, endova the endovascular structures. And a big part of that is when, and, and this is common in the setting of like an, a, 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 an acute myocardial infarction or an occlusive myocardial infarction, where you have a plaque that breaks off, that would be a classic example of activation of the intrinsic system. Um, collagen fibers are exposed and that begins various activation of clotting factors. And we call this the intrinsic pathway. right? And then if it happens here, we call it the extrinsic pathway. And both of these meet together in what is called the common pathway. And, and clearly these can both occur at the same time as well, um, even though I talk about them separately. All right. So that's kind of what happens there. Um, so in the extrinsic, you essentially have tissue factors, damaged tissues release various tissue factors that start this. And then this starts at factor seven here, right? Your tissue factor. And essentially what happens is anytime you have a factor in its inactive form, it will just go by its name. So five, six, seven, the other name for factor seven is um, a serum prothrombin conversion accelerator. So that's why we just call it factor seven, it's easier. But when a factor gets activated, it gets a little A after it. So when seven gets activated, it, we call it 7567A, and that means active. That's the active form. So you see here that factor seven gets converted to seven A, that's the active form of factor seven. And then that in the presence of calcium will feed into the common pathway, right? And here you have factor 10, for example, all right? Factor 10 is also known as Stewart factor or Stewart power factor, I believe. Um, and then its active form is factor 10A, right? Whereas over here with the intrinsic fact, uh, system, this activates 12, factor 12, which is Hagman factor, I believe. And then it gets activated and it becomes 12A. All right. And then it feeds in here. And then you have factor nine gets converted to factor 9A. Um, or no, 11, excuse me, 11 gets converted to 11A, which is plasma thromboplastin, all right? And then IX is factor nine, gets converted to factor 9A, um, which is plasma thromboplastin. Um, and then factor eight gets converted to factor 8A, um, which is anti-hemophilic factor. So it should come as no surprise that certain types of hemophilia involve deficiencies of this factor. Other types of hemophilia involve factor seven here. But you see, it's just one factor activating another, activates another, activates another, on down the line until you get to the final steps in this cascade. And the final steps are really... Uh, thrombin and prothrombin in fibrin and fibrinogen. So factor two is what's known as prothrombin. And remember when we talked about the PT, the prothrombin time, 
that's actually what we're looking at is the amount of time it takes for prothrombin to convert into a thrombin clock. All right. So prothrombin ultimately gets turned into thrombin, which is factor 2A. So thrombin is the active form of prothrombin. And pro, whenever you see pro in front of something, pro just means that it is in its inactive form. For example, a pro drug is a drug that we give somebody that is inactive. And then after that drug gets metabolized, which is something we're going to talk about tomorrow, it gets metabolized into its active form, and we call that the drug. A classic example of this is acetyl salicylic acid or ASA. When we give somebody acetyl salicylic acid, it is inactive until it goes into their body, it gets metabolized into salicylic acid. So the acetyl group gets cut off of it and it gets converted into the active form of salicylic acid, right? That's an example of a prodrug. Well, that's what, so prothrombin is the inactive form of thrombin, thrombin is the active form. And then fibrin, fibrin and fibrinogen, factor two. And on down to factor one, ultimately. And factor one is fibrinogen converting into a fibrin plug or fibrin polymer. So basically fibrinogen is separate little chunks. And the final step of the clotting cascade is activating the, fi uh, the, the fibrinogen and allowing those little chunks to come together and to connect together and form a stable plug. Now, when platelet aggregation happens, platelets can clump together to form a plug, but that is a very unstable, very temporary situation, right? Um, and that kind of is like, that like slows things down a bit and allows time for this whole clotting cascade to um, do its thing, if you will, and to form that fibrin, that stable fibrin plug, all right? And there are many different, what are called cofactors as well. For example, calcium. Calcium acts as a very important cofactor. And if you do not have calcium present, you actually cannot clot because you can see at several points in here, um, calcium is required as a cofactor. Um, in fact, one of the ways that we prevent blood from clotting, like when we draw blood or when you donate blood, um, oftentimes what you will do is you will mix that blood in a solution of citrate, sodium citrate specifically, and the citrate binds all the calcium in that blood and prevents it from clotting, right? Um, so that's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is by um, various agents that inhibit these various clotting factors, right? Inhibit the function of these various uh, clotting factors. And medications that do that are collectively referred to as anticoagulants. And can anyone give me an example of a common anticoagulant? Heparin or Coumadin, right? Yeah, heparin. Yeah, yeah. We kind of just talked about that. Yeah, heparin. Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, the next question is, well, how does heparin work? Does anyone happen to know? So would it basically be an adjunct for the, what would you call it, the intrinsic system? That way it kind of goes in with the thrombin and then turns into- So actually heparin works, well, heparin's fairly complicated. It inhibits um, many different kinds of proteins, but the most important is um, it, it, it inhibits factor 2A. Um, so heparin works right here by preventing prothrombin so it prevents prothrombin or inhibits the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. 
So heparin works right here. And does that make sense? Why we would look at the PT to determine how heparin is working for somebody or if they're overdosed, right? Because PT is specifically looking at that prothrombin time, the amount of time it takes for um, prothrombin to become thrombin. So heparin is inhibitory right here, right? Um, let's take uh, Coumadin, for example. Uh, or uh, does anyone know what the other name for Coumadin is? Clavix. Nope. No, Clavix, Clavix is clopidogrel. What about Coumadin? Warfarin. Warfarin. Warfarin, good, good, Warfarin, yeah. Now, the way that Coumadin or Warfarin works is it actually inhibits an enzyme that recycles vitamin K. And vitamin K acts as a cofactor, kind of like calcium. Um, it acts as an important cofactor for the, um, the activation of various other factors. And so Coumadin works by inhibiting vitamin K synthesis. Um, and that actually indirectly inhibits multiple other factors such as two, um, vitamin K is, is required um, for prothrombin to thrombin, uh, seven as well. Vitamin K, this is a vitamin K dependent uh, pathway. Uh, let's see here, um, factors nine as well, uh, right in here, Coumadin is, is needed. And even factor 10, uh, Coumadin is uh, needed right here, or um, <laughs> Coumadin, vitamin K is required there, all right. And then the newer agents, the so-called DOACs, are you all familiar with the newer agents? No. These are um, incredibly common and they are actually replacing things like Coumadin. Um, so the, the DOACs are the direct oral, direct acting oral anticoagulants. And um, they work by um, inhibiting very specific clotting factors. Um, a lot of them actually inhibit factor 10A. Uh, so let's see if I can find 10A right here. So a lot of the DOACs are very direct acting, like right here. So things like um, dabigatrin, um, or Pradaxia is a trade name. Eloquist is another one. So Eloquist and um, uh, Pradaxia, thing, agents like that. Um, and the reason that they are becoming so popular is that they are very specific. They only, you know, like, like Coumadin, it's, it, it interacts with multiple different clotting factors. It's messy. It interacts with lots of different medications. Its therapeutic index is real narrow. Um, these newer agents um, really are very specific. They're very sp specific, direct acting. They don't interact with as many medications. And you just stop taking them. And within a day or so, um, their effects tend to go away. Um, so the safety profile in general is a lot better for these agents as well. So you are going to run into more people taking these DOACs um, for, you know, after they've had their heart valves replaced, or if they've had a, a DVT, or they've had a pulmonary embolism, right, they require anticoagulation, you're going to see a lot more people on these DOACs as opposed to the more traditional agents like um, uh, Coumadin, for example. All right. So I just wanted to kind of cover that, bring that up. Um, it's, it's, it's actually super complicated. Uh, we're just going to kind of dip our toes in, 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 into the, the waters of uh, coagulation. And we will redux this. We'll talk about this again in cardiovascular disorders. And we'll talk about this again in hematology a little later on in the paramedic program. But with that in mind, that is really all of the core material that I want to lecture on with you all. 
me uh, go back to my Zoom here. Uh, okay, the next thing, let's see, Dakota. Yeah, I got you sorted there. Um, the last thing I want to do before I let you all go is to make sure that you all can access the um, final exam. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is just one more time, I'm going to show you where you all can find that and what it should look like. So let me go ahead and get into my screen share. Let me just get rid of these PowerPoints or my, my computer's getting a little overwhelmed here. All right. So one more time. Let me just share this. Make sure you all can see it. Okay. So you go into Platinum Planner and log in. So what you're going to do is on your, your main dashboard, when you log in, you should see open tests. All right. And you should have an open test. And remember, what we want to do is we want to go into EMS testing. All right. So we're going to go down and I'm going to log in as a student. And we're going to focus on the left column here once we go in. And if we go all the way down on the left column, all the way down, you see this little box that says pathophysiology block exam. And then you have this select, select, selector option that says take test. That is where you click to access and take the final exam for the course. It's so 100 questions, and I believe you'll have two and a half hours uh, to do that in. So before I let you all go, are there any questions? OK. Uh, the other thing uh, you will see within the next couple of minutes, the pharmacology class open in Canvas. It will be available. Uh, you will want to at least get into the um, start, the very first module, start here, do the netiquette statement like you have to on every class. Um, and we will hit the ground running tomorrow um, with uh, pharmacology. We will not have a lab tomorrow. It'll be all lecture tomorrow. But Thursday afternoon at 2.30, there will be a lab. And I, of course, I'll let you all know that uh, tomorrow as well. Um, so... To conclude, the final exam for pathophysiology will be due by midnight tonight. Uh, so please make sure that you can get it done. Uh, it's multiple choice, 100 questions. You have two and a half hours to complete it. Make sure you read every question. You know what the question's asking. Look for special words like which of the following is the most, least, except, which is not, right? Make sure you read the questions and you actually know what they're asking before you uh, go down to the answer. Um, and that's a lot of times just half the struggle is what is the question actually asking? What do they want? Um, so before I let you all go, are there any questions, concerns, hints, allegations, or anything otherwise? So Coumadin needs potassium. Is that what you said earlier? No, no, Coumadin, no, it works by inhibiting the synthesis of vitamin K. Okay, I just missed that part. Yeah, it actually it inhib it inhibits an enzyme. There's an enzyme that recycles vitamin K. It inhibits that enzyme. And then that essentially inhibits um, the production of active vitamin K. And that vitamin K is needed as a cofactor to activate several other clotting factors. Um, and so that's kind of how um, Coumadin works. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, any other question, any, anything about, is everybody okay as far as the final goes in accessing it? And uh, okay, well, um, 
Thank you all so much. It was uh, uh, absolutely a pleasure. I, I love teaching pathophysiology, even though it is a tough class. And there's a lot of content. Um, I just love covering it. And um, I also like pharmacology. So I really look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow morning. Take care. Be safe out there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Uh, let me see if I can get this up.